Um, well, thank you for asking, asking me along to, to speak this morning. It's good to see so many faces that I know as well. Um, hello to you all and thank you for, for coming along. Uh, yeah, as, uh, as Robert said, I'm Ian Richards. I'm the archivist for the National Trust for Scotland. It's a post I've, I've filled since 2002. And for two years prior to that, I worked as a seasonal assistant guide at Kelly Castle, as I mentioned. Um, and as part of that role, began researching information about the Lorimer family. Um, in particular, actually, Robert Lorimer, because in, in between times, I was um, uh, in between guiding. I was also at St Andrews University doing a degree in architectural history. So Robert was a, a particular fascination uh, of mine. Um, initially, this research that I was doing was purely to help me with guiding, but I didn't realize at the time what the future had in store and how I was later to be more deeply involved with Kelly and the Lorimer family. Be before I started though, I just wanted to issue an, uh, an apology. When Aline Wendy uh, asked me to speak at the meeting originally planned for May, my plan was to go to Kelly in the spring to conduct more research and to get more images of the archives, but obviously this wretched virus um, uh, stopped that or put pay to that and prevented us from showing you the archives in person. But I hope that the items that we do show are of some interest. So the plan for the talk really was to, I was gonna give a, a bit of background following on from Antonia's uh, wonderful talk about John Henry, just to give a little bit of background to Hugh Lorham, John's nephew, um, and uh, the setting up of the archive room and then show some of the documents within the collection. Now, I realize I'm probably preaching to the choir and that many of you will know far more than me about Hugh and his life, but I thought that perhaps I will refresh our memories and run through very briefly a bit of biographical information about Hugh, just in case there are some areas of Hugh's life you didn't know about. Hugh was born in Edinburgh on the 22nd of May, 1907, the second son of the distinguished architect, Robert Lorimer, and his wife, Violet Wilde. He attended Car Cargillfield School and then Loretto School, and then went to Magdalen College, Oxford, but left after a year. He traveled shortly, he traveled in France before returning to Scotland and joining the Edinburgh College of Art. Shortly after his father, Father Robert passed away in 1929, Hugh changed direction and began studying sculpture. In 1934, he spent some time on a placement with the Eric Gill studio at Piggott's, a trip that was organized by the then principal of the college, Hubert Wellington. After the placement and further travels in Europe, studying Romanesque stone carving, he was awarded a Grant Bequest Fellowship. In 1935, he married Mary McLeod Wiley, who was also an artist, and they moved to an address in Edinburgh. However, at about the time World War II broke out, Hugh and Mary moved to Fife. In 1941, he approached the Earl of Mar, Mar and Kelly about taking up the tenancy of Kelly Castle, which had been restored by his grandfather, Professor James Lorimer, and sub subsequently held on an improving lease by John Henry, Hugh's uncle. Hugh and Mary bought Kelly outright in 1958. Now, for some reason, Ah, it is working. That's good. I do apologize. I'll go back. After the war, Hugh worked on many sculptural commissions, which made his name, uh, of course, including Our Lady of the Isles on South Uist and the wonderful allegorical figures on the facade of the National Library of Scotland on George IV Bridge in Edinburgh. From the early 1960s, Hugh became the National Trust for Scotland representative in Fife and got deeply involved in Trust's Little House Improvement Scheme, of which more later. And as I'm sure you know, Kelly Castle passed into the hands of the National Trust for Scotland in 1970, shortly after Mary's sad passing. Um, I should have mentioned, it's a bit, little bit daunting about speaking about Hugh's, um, Hugh's life with, with his, uh, two of his children listening in, but I should say any, uh, any mistakes I've made, please, please holler at the end of the talk and please let me know where I've gone wrong. As I mentioned, when I was first appointed to the archivist role for the trust, one of my first tasks was to get involved with the Lorimer Archive Project. Now this was part of a larger scheme which also involved the setting up of the Hugh Lorimer Studio. All of this had been in train some time before I started working, but my understanding is that around 1999, the Lorimer family in consultation with other bodies began discussions about setting up two particular projects. One was to recreate um, Hugh's sculptural studio uh, in, the, in the stables there, in an area where there could be displayed particular items that Hugh used, together with some interpretation 
using photographs and panels. And now I believe that the plan was to recreate the studio as if you had just popped out for a while. The second project was to initiate a room specifically designed to house the archival material that had been collected by Hugh over his many years at Kelly. It was decided that although the papers still belonged to the Lorimer family, it would be more suitable and relevant to house the papers at Kelly, and which would also afford access to researchers. Now, initially the plan was to have the archive room in an upper floor of the older North Tower of the castle, but this plan was stymied when during the renovation of the room, an old inscription was found over the fireplace. An alternative was sought and a room on the top floor of the East Tower, which you can see in the center of the screen there, was deemed to be the most suitable. In terms of setting up the room, my predecessor in the Trust Archives, Carolyn Bain, spent a number of days during 2000, year 2000, identifying, collecting, and boxing up all of Hugh's books, periodicals, various papers and letters, and files relating to Hugh's work as the Trust's FIFO representative. There are also drawings, photos, photo albums, slides. Now, most of this material was in various locations at Kelly, but other papers were found or deposited subsequently. A basic hand list of all the boxes was created, and it was my job to list many of the items in more detail. Initially, I began working through all of the books, the periodicals and magazines that you had collected. Now, I should add at this point that for a number of months during the very cold winter of 2002 to three, just after I started working in the archives, I worked one day per week in the upper East Tower, wrapped up as best I could um, to stave off the cold and standing astride a, a small heater for warmth and also leaning towards the, uh, the only small window uh, in this room for light, whilst listing all of, the, all of the published material. As I was to find out later, that's uh, true archival work. In the meantime, the National Register of Archives for Scotland came to collect a number of boxes and manuscript material, which they had previously agreed to survey, whilst I was engaged to undertake the cataloging and preservation of the rest of the collection. Now, the NRAS produced an outline survey of this collection, which is available online to, all, well, to everybody, um, all researchers under the reference NRAS 4100. Um, if you want the link for that, then just, just let me know at the end and I can, I can provide the link. Uh, but it's on the National Records of Scotland website. And I should also point out that if we do get any inquiries into the collection, I also seek the family's permission before researchers can use the material. Now, this particular section of the archive, which was surveyed by the NRAS, um, is a wonderful testament to Hugh Lorimer, his involvement with Kelly and his work and, 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 and his family. And contained within it are a number of different series of documents. We've got files of personal correspondence. We've got letters relating to Hugh's early artistic career. We've got later correspondence relating to his sculptural commissions. We've got transcripts, transcripts of talks and lectures given by Hugh. There's legal correspondence and financial papers, documents relating to Kelly, and files pertaining to Hugh's involvement with various societies, including the St Andrew's Preservation Society and the Association for the Preservation of Rural Scotland. And as I mentioned, there's also papers relating to Hugh's work as the, the trust representative in Fife and his involvement in the Little Houses scheme. Now, I appreciate that these slides may not be the most invigorating that you will see, um, but to an archivist, they are quite important. Um, and so along with and alongside the NRAS survey, I began cataloging and preserving the rest of the Lorimer archives. The way I began was to use a standard called the International Standard for Archival Description or ISAD, which basically outlines the description and the cataloging of, cataloging of an archive collection or collections. And it works from the general to the specific. So once I got a handle on the more general types of archives that were within the collection, I could then divide it into more specific series and then to list the items in a more detailed way. So what you see on this slide is a, a general overview of the collection as a whole, which is called a FONDS, F-O-N-D-S. And then uh, on the next slide um, is a more specific description of a particular element of the archive. In this case, it's the photos the photo albums and the negatives. Other series within this part of the collection include drawings and sketches, both from Hugh and uh, for, from his wife, Mary, 
Um, as I'm sure you know, Mary was a wonderful designer in her own right, and we are fortunate indeed to have these drawings in the collection. As I say, we have a number of photograph albums uh, and other collections of loose photos and slides which cover, cover a wide range of topics. And as I say, it's just such a shame that we weren't at Kelly Castle during um, a lovely summer's day where perhaps we could have got out some of these photo albums to, to show you in person. And unfortunately, because <clears throat> I was on furlough for four months and unable to get to Kelly, um, I couldn't get any more uh, photographs of these albums, but hopefully um, that's something that we can rectify at some future stage. <clears throat> but some of the photo albums are like travelogue collections, um, which we may assume came from Hugh as they detail sculptural and architectural works from trips from his trips throughout Europe. And we know that he did travel abroad in the 1930s. But we've also got miscellaneous items such as sheet music, postcards and Christmas cards. So as part of the major project, when and when the room was being set up, the walls, the flooring and the ceiling of the room were refurbished. New shelving was acquired and conservation heating was installed within. As well as undertaking all the cataloging, let's go back to that, um, we sought to preserve all of the items into acid-free archival materials, such as melanex sleeves for the photos, archive envelopes and boxes and, and such um, such other uh, acid-free archival supplies, and this is what the this is what the archive room looks like now. And on the top of the the image that you can see, there are all the NRA survey boxes, and the rest of the of the, the boxes are the ones that I've um, catalogued and preserved. And that's another part of the archive room. It does an archivist's heart good to see archive boxes on shelves. I have to say. So, as I said, pre preserving the archives is one very important aspect. Another would be affording access to researchers. And over the years, we've had some researchers accessing the material, including someone who is researching Robert Lorimer's connection with Weems Castle in Fife, another looking into Robert's association with the Fasnacar power station, and another researcher and writer um, who was extensively researching Hugh's work and his life. So what I thought I would do now um, is to present a selection of items from the collection that uh, I'd looked at previously and that I hope that you may be interested in. I apologize now for the quality of, of some of the images, but these were taken some time ago. Here is um, Hugh's birth certificate dated uh, 22nd of May, 1907. And again, just a shame that uh, we couldn't show you this uh, in May. Here is a telegram um, to Hugh's father, Robert, congratulating uh, on, on Hugh's birth or the birth of twins, because uh, Hugh was a twin with his sister, Daphne. I believe this may be from Mr. John Holmes, who was the owner of Four Making House um, that Robert Orma was then in the process of designing. And I like his comment, hearty congratulations. I wish you could build houses as fast as families. Now, that's obviously a comment on, on Robert's speed in, in building houses. We've also got um, Hughes Edinburgh College of Art student passbook from 1927 and 1928. Um, some of his test marks. It's probably a bit cruel of me to, to show this, particularly as it shows that uh, Hugh um, only seemed to get 35% for sketching and measuring. So we'll perhaps we'll, we'll brush over that. We obviously improved greatly after this. Now, this is a letter dated September 1934 from Hubert Wellington congratulating Hugh on his engagement to, to Mary, and also discussing his imminent placement with the Eric Gill studio. Professor Wellington was the principal of the Co Edinburgh College of Art from 1932 to 1942, and it was he who arranged Lorimer's placement with Gill. Here he says that, I can think of nothing so well suited to your development. And there are many letters from Wellington in the main collection of Lorimer papers. Along Sorry, that, that's a letter from, uh, uh, from Hubert Wellington. Alongside this, we've got uh, a certificate of introduction from the Edinburgh College of Art, signed by Hubert Wellington, stating that Hugh is a student traveling around Europe on behalf of the college. We've also got letters to and from Hugh, and this is a, a postcard from his father, uh, Robert, while he was on active service uh, in the First World War. In Cairo, I believe. Um, <clears throat> to finish, oh, to finish with, well, one of my favorite items is a letter, um, well, it's not, not just one of my favorite items in the Kelly collection, but in all of our archives. It's a delightful note written by Hugh to his father whilst he was at Cargill School. 
Um, I love the way he was so pleased with his cricketing pro prowess, even though he uh, misspelled not without the first K, but also how, how pleased his swimming master was uh, with his side stroke. And you can see a little drawing of you doing his side stroke there. I should also add that it, um, it wasn't me that put the punch marks in that, in that letter. It's not something I would recommend uh, as an archivist. <clears throat> To conclude the talk, I just wanted to mention something that came to mind whilst preparing this. Alongside the Lorimer family's association with Kelly and Hughes sculpture, there are many other areas of potential research within the Lorimer archive. And one which has piqued my interest is Hughes' involvement with the National Trust for Scotland. He was, as I mentioned, he was a NTS representative in Fife from the early 1960s until well into the 70s and in, into the early 80s. and was also very much involved in the Trust Little Houses Improvement Scheme. And here is a photo um, of the Giles uh, in Pittenween uh, in the Eastern Yonker Fife, a group of buildings at the harbour, which had been previously owned by Hugh's brother Christopher and which Hugh himself rented in the early 1940s. The Giles, I think, are the, are the group of buildings directly facing you or directly facing the harbour. To confuse matters slightly, the, the building on the right hand side at right angles to it is called Giles House, which is a, 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 a complete, it was a completely separate restoration. The buildings, the, the Giles buildings were purchased by the National Trust for Scotland in 1963 as part of their Little Houses Improvement Scheme. Restoration was undertaken by Wheeler and Sproson Architects and was completed in 1966. According to Douglas Bremler in his History of the National Trust for Scotland published in 2001, Hugh showed great enthusiasm for this scheme and even persuaded owners of some derelict properties uh, in some of the villages and towns in the East Nuka Fire to sell their houses to the trust for restoration. Hugh also wrote a piece for Country Life in August 1963 about the scheme entitled New Life for Old, Bur Old Burrows in which he extolled the virtues of crowstep crow gables and pantard roofs. And also in 1969, Hugh addressed the delegates of the meeting of Europa Nostra whose theme was the Little Houses Improvement Scheme, and copies of this are held in, in our archive collection. Now, as I say, there seem to be a number of correspondence files in the collection related to Hugh and the Trust and about the scheme, which would definitely merit further ins uh, inspection. And that's my plan. As soon as I'm able to attend Kelly, and as soon as we're able to be free uh, of, the, of the virus, and that we're able to travel a bit more. But um, that's one for the future. Perhaps that's one for a future lecture, um, we, we, we shall see. Um, I don't seem to have any control over, over, my, um, over my PowerPoint. It seems to be flicking through, but that, that's finished now. Um, thank you for listening. Um, if there are any questions, please, please do let me know or just drop me a line on the, uh, on the Zoom um, page. But uh, thank you for listening and I hope that was of, of some interest to you.